Just that. jamming out here to the song. Yep. <laughs> hey, everybody. I am Jeff Fuller from Fuller Embroidery Works, and we have Justin Armenta from JA Digitizing Studios. And today we have a special guest. Uh, we have Joe Kramer from Amber Creative, and we'll let Justin introduce him here in a second. I just wanted to mention that only 20% of our viewers are subscribed to us on YouTube. So if you guys could hit the like and subscribe button, that would definitely help us out. But I'll go ahead and let Justin take over. Yeah, so uh, Joe uh, taught a class with me at uh, Impressions Expo Long Beach this year. Um, it was an awesome experience. Uh, him and I got to teach with Eric Campbell. Uh, we had a great time. We had a great crowd. Uh, I learned a lot from from both of these guys just sitting in the class with them. Uh, I sat in. Uh, Joe had another class that he did on his own, uh, kind of covering the stuff that we're going to talk about today. And honestly blew my mind uh i've been in the industry almost 30 years and there was stuff in there that you know i never knew and and i learned and kind of open up some uh some ideas that start flowing in my head uh so hopefully uh the information you can share today kind of kind of does the same for you but um uh just a little bit about joe read his bio here uh he was originally from el centro california Got his start in 1995 at a small screen print embroidery shop called Driscoll Sports. Uh, for 29 years, Joe's woven creativity into fabric, thread, and ink. Uh, master of apparel decoration, his artistry shines between the worlds of embroidery, applique, and screen print, and special effects, leaving a trail of stunning designs in his wake. Uh, his current passions don't stop at just mastering the needle and thread. Joe has expanded his artistry, artistic tapestry into the realms of video animation, audio video production, proving his creative spirit knows no bounds. Uh, as an experienced innovator, he thrives to thrives in the fast paced world of high tech driving companies forward and shaping industry trends. Joan has done developing, development and creative work for many retail brands such as Amber, Abercrombie and Fitch, as my daughter used to call it, Abercrombie and Finch. Uh, brands, limited brands, uh, Aritzia, Bruce Lee Limited, Marshall Retail, VF Outdoor, and NASA, to name a few. Joe is currently works with Amber Creative, a cutting-edge design firm based out of Denver, Colorado, especially specializing in developing high-end apparel branding. He currently lives in Phoenix, Arizona, with his wife, April, a Colorado native, so... Let me grab Joe here and introduce him. Hey, hey. Hey. All right. Thanks for having me. Yeah, no problem. Thanks for coming. Good, good to see you again, Justin and Jeff. Good to meet you. Yeah, good to meet you. So, like I said, um, I got the opportunity to teach with Joe. The first time meeting him uh, a couple weeks ago in Long Beach. Uh, we yep. had a great time. Great information. Um but yeah, tell us tell us a little about the the type of stuff that's kind of outside the norm of yeah, let's say ninety percent of of what our viewers and customers and everybody does in the embroidery industry. I, absolutely honored to. So thank you again uh, for that intro. So uh, basically, um, when I got started doing uh, traditional embroidery, you know, it was mid nineties, right? There was the tablets and. It was still, even though Windows 95 had come out, it was still like DOS based, you know, or three, uh, 286, 386, it's been ported at, at during those times, you know, uh, systems. And it was very like fill stitch, satin stitch, like running, running stitches were only really for, you know, being able to get around so you didn't have to do a trim. You know, that was, that was the, the thought behind traditional embroidery. And, um, at the time, I worked for a shop that was, you know, very standard. I mean, they had like, at the time, like three, three, six heads and maybe, you know, three or four uh, single heads for like um, personalization, you know, uses, etc. cetera. But, uh, you know, th those were some like single head Toyotas that you would just select the font and punch it into the screen and just, it would just figure it out for you. You, didn't have to, you know, if, it, if the brush script didn't line up, the kerning was off, that's just how you sold it. You know, you took a buck off and you made them eat it, you know, like, <laughs> That kind of thing, and so because uh, no one, you know, no digitizer is going to take the time to change. Not in those days, it's not like that. So uh, I remember that was kind of like where I got my start. That that environment of a shop, you know. And um, as I moved through this 
you know, but I don't know, seven or eight years behind me at that time, it was, I just, next thing I know, I'm, I'm being you know, hauled off to Columbus, Ohio, where they, um, you know, uh, Abercrombie Fitch hires me as a screen print and embroidery technician. And even in those days, I mean, a small, small town, I grew up in a predominantly farming town in um, Southern California. You know, we didn't really have, there was no big names in our town. It wasn't like there, were, there was anything to, to um, put a flag in the ground over. And so when I got hauled off to Columbus, I, I had this constant um, thought of like, you know, why me? Kind of like a little bit of like an imposter type of syndrome. Like I just don't understand why you guys can't find good help out here. It, just, it, it didn't really resonate with me until six months in and I realized that they're hiring people straight out of design school that have never seen a digitizing tablet, never seen what it takes to do the process, um, never in their lives. They have no idea what it takes. All that they're taught, at least as merchants, uh, for like the merchants coming out of business school, is how to grind somebody on price. And the designers really just get taught how to create tech packs and hope that what's in them is right. No auditing or necessarily checking and double checking what's in the tech pack. They just rip the factory apart when the sample comes back and it's not right. And that's a, just a, it's, it's just a very chaotic environment. You know, fast pace doesn't always mean good, right? Mm. Kind of thing. So in, in those days uh, that we're talking like early 2000s, um, you know, we were challenged way at the beginning, at least before my time there with Abercrombie. Uh, there was no shiny thread. It, it would, it's not so much that they were too arrogant to have it as much as it was that sewing thread was far more available in the factories offshore than um, than anything, really. So, you know, your, your gray spools were much more available, you know, to die at that factory level, like they would just, oh yeah, you know, my, my cousin so so across across town, like you know, he'll he'll dye those up in the next, you know, 24, 48 hours and have them ready to go into production. So it's a completely different, you know, arena than the commercial embroidery industry that we know here in the US. What do we embroider with? Well we embroider with on the shelf. And then we put that in the shelf. So um one of the things too that you have to learn um, when you're overseas or doing business overseas is that nobody uses, I mean, it's, it's far beyond the imperial and the metric system and the, the debate. It's even worse than that. I mean, different countries, different regions of the world, um, they sell their thread with different settings and almost all sewing thread is sold with a text size, right? say, set, you know, sticker on the inside of the spool. And that's what, that's how everybody, did everything, because, um, there were just so many different things that we that we could do because we were willing to change thread size. So if you want tiny letters, you know, I mean, what's what do you guys? Or I mean, anything lower than like point two, and I'm like telling the customer this is not good. Right. You know, I, I try to keep it at like a quarter inch tall, and I try to keep them all uppercase. And I, you know what I mean? Like all those all those like safety net rules, right? That we have so that our embroidery letters don't get too small to be achieved. And then once you find out they're doing it on like a like a thin knit, you're like, just don't even don't even do this, you know, because it's gonna just turn into hamburger, no matter what I sent that down. Mm -hmm. So um, so this was a time when, uh, going back to uh, at least the or the, the origins, this is a time where, uh, you know, you really couldn't get polyester. I mean, I think rayon was probably gonna be your your best type of thread offshore, but Rayon was taking on, at the time anyway, Rayon was taking on a new um, face because uh, bel believe it or not, the green movement had, you know, was even before my time, it's just, it, it, I feel like it just kind of, as I get through the industry, it kind of moves its way through different parts of the industry, but nobody wanted to call it bamboo. Bamboo had a bad name at the time and bamboo was kind of known for uh, utilizing a tremendous amount of resources. And it does. Uh, resources, it just eats up a lot of resources to make, you know, uh, fibers from bamboo. It's a process, even though it's organic, technically. And I remember at the time, uh, it had a, a bad name. 
So they started calling it Rayon. This is what it is. Rayon and Bamboo are one and the same. So just cause some difference. So, you know, whatever organization stops sending us hate. And so uh, what we did was we work with the factories. Okay, well, then what do you have? What's readily available with, you know, for these particular things? And they're just like sewing. So, um, and even today, like I was telling uh, uh, Justin and in all my classes, it, you go to the Dillard's, you go to all the high-end retail, everything is sewing thread that's in the malls, all the Ralph Lauren stuff. They're using a super expensive French, you know, cotton wrap polyester core thread. It runs gloriously in the machines uh it's got a higher tensile strength it doesn't shrink um there was a lot of laboratory tests that we did where uh we were getting anywhere between uh five and ten percent uh shrink length um over one one laundering cycle with embroidery thread. and with sewing thread we were getting less than two percent so anybody out there who's been embroidering like left chest um it you know using embroidery thread and you're so frustrated because you're pounding that thing full of stitches and you start getting the waves and the potato chip shapes and such and then you launder it and it's just even worse um you could be you you know suffering from the thread itself is just shrinking and one of the biggest challenges that I think that we face as digitizers and embroiders, just producers in general, is that we don't know how people are laundering their goods. So it really, that plays into a huge, you know, what happens after five washes, what happens after 10 washes. Um, so at Abercrombie, we, we laboratoried all of that. We needed to know what it looks like after 50 washes. Is the thread still holding up or is it just peeling really badly? Is is the, the color fastness holding true. And and the good thing too about doing vintage looks is if it gets beat up, that's fine. But you don't want the threads to unravel and you don't want to, to create so many long throw lengths that if you do have a thread break, you, you can still run the machine backwards and then come back over the top of it without having to do anything to the thread to keep it from unraveling. I think that's one of the biggest uh, differences between, you know, working with a retail brand when you're developing products that you have to think about the long-term usage, you yeah. know, I would say, you know, 99% of the production oriented embroidery businesses, they're, they're doing the garments, you know, drop shipping, doing the garments and the garments leave and they don't, they don't hear anything about it. I mean, they might get some negative feedback is the only feedback they maybe yeah. get if a design's falling apart or, uh, but yeah, that's just another aspect that, you know, I don't think in production you, you have the time or, or the, or the, uh, manpower to be washing and testing on the regular basis. Um, but if you are exper experimenting with different threads and stuff, that might be something where you want to test out and, and throw through the wash a couple of times to, to see what's going to happen with those threads that you're not too, fa too familiar with. Yeah, great point. I mean, and the other the other thing to think about too is what have you got to lose? You know, do a little bit of testing. It's not going to cost you much. Then a little bit of time. I mean, the machine, the washing machine is what does the work. Right. So it's not like uh, you know you're having to uh, work too terribly difficult. You know, to to, to test this, these things out. So the backing um, is a whole nother deal, just because, of the, like I said, the samples that I have, um, at least that I showed at the show, was being able to introduce. Uh, full you know full front embroidery uh that has no backing you know it did when we when we originally sewed it but uh you know it didn't have any once it washed away in the first wash so that was another big part of it so if the fabric you know as as, as we know if all fabric's going to shrink i don't think there's any one thing like like catch all solution to what we know as pre-shrunk um the fabric will shrink again after even pre-shrunk fabric. Mm -hmm. um, I have to say the only exception I've seen is probably some of the, the, the pigment dye garments out there just because they have been washed and scour washed so many times, you know, before they hit the shelves. But uh, the, but I'm very cautious about sewing, especially pounding stitches into a pigment dye because the, the yarn has suffered such a, a tremendous amount of abuse to get that pigment dye, that vintage look, you know, in there. 
So you'll actually, you know, I would avoid pigment t-shirts like a, a leg, but a, <laughs> even a pigment, um, a pigment fleece is really nice to take a needle, but you've got to be very minimal on the penetration. Like don't put any more in there and you absolutely have to because, you know, you hold it up to the light and you see that massacre, you know, then you know that you're, uh, the, the, the yarn in which the fabric is made of, it's just not going to hold up, you know, I, but on the, on the flip side, um, you know, I've used like 4.3 ounce or to, to five ounce, hundred percent cotton Jersey. It was, it has no polyester in it and they, they can take a needle pretty good, but, um, not not a, you know a lot of density so we'll um we'll, we'll show some samples here in a second um, so yeah so a lot of the, a lot of what joe was talking about was not only the the different threads that he used and uh and and i'm sure joe's gonna explain a little bit in in better detail than i have but um the the term weight that everybody is you know pretty much buys their thread in um is kind of misleading and it doesn't really give you the the thickness of the thread in that value um, right. so, so yeah, using those alternative threads and, and the sewing threads like Joe's referring to, um, there is a, a, I guess a thickness value that he worked with a lot, which is called Tex. And that's actually kind of refers to the actual thickness of the thread. Yeah, that's, so, that's really correct. Yeah. So, so it's the, the di dif differences of thickness of threads that you can use and you can, you know, manipulate your densities on top of, you know, using the alternative backings and stuff is is where you're kind of really achieving that that different look and that different feel than that regular everyday 40 weight thread with you know cutaway backing that majority of us use in the right industry. yep absolutely so um i'll at least jump into that uh, real quick if you guys want to see uh, and i'll try to do the short version I think I, <laughs> I think i went on for like 30 minutes just on how you know like not just the thread values, but like how the one measurement that the industry gives us is the most useless measurement right. that we have as digitizers, which is, you know, the weight. Oh, how, you know, how much, you know, for, was it 40 grams or, or I don't know. Four kilograms over a thousand. Yeah. Yeah. One, one, gram, gram, is. one gram is 40 meters. And that's why they call it number 40, or 40 weight thread. Like, really? I'm like, hey, hey, Jeff, how's that 40 gram, you know, thread working out for you? I mean, what a, what a, it just, depends on how much dye they use. Right? Silly <laughs> measurement, you know. So, um, for, so what did size, and then of course, the same thing with the software, you know, I'm not knocking the softwares, but, you know, if they only render one size of thread, then you have to go off of, you know, a different trial and error system of, you know, we put this thickness in, you ran it at this density. Let's try to remember that. The density on screen isn't going to give you any kind of a relevant reference. Yeah, the first time I was digitizing for Bermalana, I was it was I have to keep telling myself it's not what you see on screen. You got to yeah. you got to trust the values that you know that you're, it's yeah. going to work. Exactly. Where you turn off the render, you're like no render. I just want yeah. Lines. Give me yeah. lines. Just give me lines. Yeah. Exactly. Uh, let me see here if I can show uh, here. I don't know if you could maybe pull your mic up closer to yourself or something. You're just cutting in and out sometimes, Joe. Okay, you got it. While you're pulling that up, let me grab some uh, some comments here. We got uh, Ramona. She was in our class. Uh, wanted to ask about the sewing thread. One of the things I've heard you say is that it needs to be a good quality polycore thread. So I think. Yeah asking for, as far as maybe it's spe specific absolutely so that that uh, that polycore i mean the polycore in almost all not just threads but the you know yarns to make you know knits from or, or or anything of that nature the poly really is the strength of the thread it 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 does so much for the overall strength and elongation um and like just i mean everybody knows what it's like to have you know, a uh, 40 weight thread wrapped around your leg in the embroidery shop and you're trying to just get that spool to just leave you alone for just a few minutes. <laughs> and you go to snap that thing and you realize you had like three wraps around your leg, not one. And you're like, that thread's pretty strong. Like that, you know, it burns your skin a little bit. And you're like, whoa, that was, 
it was wonderful. So <clears throat> then there's uh, when you go into the sewing thread realm, um, I feel like it's, you know, it's stronger. It's even more relentless, you know, and can really do some uh, some frustrating damage. But uh, but yes, that's the, the polycore is what makes it so incredibly strong uh, for sure. Um, and yeah, Ramona, she was very, Ramona was very engaging at that, uh, at, at the show. She was, she had a lot of questions and, uh, and rightfully so this is uncharted territory for a lot of people. Right. Right. <clears throat> um, let's see here. Okay. I've got one of my slides up that I didn't show at the, at the show just because it, I, I kind of like added it, but, uh, let's see here sharing hit, hit the present thing sorry gents I don't know no, about it. It. it says it says share screen and then I said share it you if you have that. more than one screen you have to pick the screen yeah and you might have to when there's only one screen definitely have multiple screens here maybe it's trying to tell me something on the screen that's all right. We'll figure this out. But uh, let's see. <clears throat> as far as, uh, while I'm pulling this up here, as far as some of the things that landed with you, Justin, um, did what, what were some of the ideas that you had for, for testing this? Like you, you and I were kind of nerding out on this uh, at the show. Uh, well, before the show started, we were actually talking about um, right now in Tucson, the, the Tucson Rodeo is a big thing yeah. here. Uh, in February comes up and my uh, my company that I manage uh, production at, we we design and, and do all their merch that they sell at the, at the rodeo. Um, so I, I came back from the show kind of thinking because, you know, they, they kind of give us free range as far as creativity and, and whatnot in their designs. Um, but in, in my brain was kind of like knowing the the embroidered goods that they're doing, I was like, oh man, I'm just, my mind starts flowing of, of different things and different looks that I know they would love. But unfortunately the, the timing coming back from the show was, was right. I was diving right back into to yeah. the rodeo stuff. When I got back, didn't have time to get the threads in and stuff, but you know, full fronts of sweatshirts and stuff like that, knowing that trying to do a lot on it. You start getting curling a lot. You start getting a uh, high stitch counts. Um, but that was one of the things that, uh, that I wanted to kind of experiment with. And, um, even with just the, the 3d puff stuff, I wanted to kind of experiment with the thicker threads and see what I could come up with, uh, yeah. some different looks. Right. Right. Yeah. It was, um, I, I had a really like shot in the dark with this presentation. I think I, I typed most of it up while I was on the plane. <laughs> um just i think it was just because you know with the with the the trifecta like it was like no i didn't know i knew generally what you were going to present but i didn't know specifically you know like you know because i mean just puff hat embroidery alone is like that's a whole class right that's a whole thing and then um and of course eric you don't always know what melting pot he's gonna you know contribute right. so i was like what what is something that People just don't get to hear about and, and just in general and you know this is definitely one of it for me is is um th this was this subject is literally what a subject that's like in a box in the attic because i feel like nobody wants to know about it nobody cares to and so i was very humbled and surprised to know that the response was what it was you know with that many um uh just from all over it was digitizers it was newbies it was you know folks that you know i i, I mean even like i gave this this mini presentation by the way it won't, for whatever reason it won't, let me, it won't let me present i hit share screen it does nothing but um, um if you want you can email it to either justin or me and yeah i'll do it now. we can pull it up yeah, yeah that'd be great uh let's go to actually you know what i'm gonna do is yeah i'll email it right now so you guys have it okay it's, it's just too it's too good to to ignore here so i'm gonna send you this so you talk about like the the text right is is what you're you're measuring mm -hmm. off but right there's also denier 
Yep, there's Denier, and then there's uh, right now. Yeah, so there's Denier, and then uh, so basically like text to Denier, they're saying is text like whatever the text number is times nine, and that gives you your Denier. Um, text to like a weight, you know. So for example, um, you had what the the theory is that. 40 weight thread is equal to 240 denier, which is equal to text 25. And so um, of the presentation, I only had, sorry, I only had Justin's email, so I sent it to Justin. But, yeah, yeah, I'm um, going to that right now. Okay, perfect. So there's a slide in there, um, Justin, it's basically what we're talking about is between eight and nine on the slide. Um, okay. Hopefully you can pull it up. And uh, I actually took time to magnify what, all of these look like under like a microscopic environment. So you with and I have a um, a one centimeter with one tenth of a millimeter line ticks in there that show you like the actual measurable width of each product. And so it kind of starts from like your normal like forty weight or text twenty seven. And it'll go ahead and go all the way up to, um, you know, Tech 77 or Burmalana. So th that right there is um, a really, really good visual, right, on how, how ridiculous it is, right? Just uh, how furry. I mean, you take that, that text, uh, let's say, 27 or 30 of a sewing thread, and you put it in the exact same file of something you've already sewn a fill stitch or a satin stitch with, and it just fills it in so nicely without overcrowding, you know, the, uh, the penetration points. Um, the, the next slide is the best chart I can probably give, which is, this is actually off the Schmetz needle website. And I really liked how they, this is probably the most accurate chart I've, I've seen, but no chart have I seen exactly compares to the next chart there always seems to be a little a little something's a little bit off on the math every time i look at it so i'm i'm not 100 percent confident but when i see it through the microscope i'm 100 percent confident that that's the size that it is and so having said all that um the next slide i think hold on let me see the next slide this would be slide number 13 actually uh ex is basically I drew each thread to scale in Adobe Illustrator and I and I drew its pitch or its density to scale to show what it looks like just because sometimes you know when we when we go to actually embroider and sew these things down you know you you do miss with the penetration point you kind of miss the exact geometry of what's going on mm -hmm. so in this regard you do get to a chance to see a little bit of that text weight um, in context. Uh, most of the stuff that I sewed and showed was, um, and since I'm having problems sharing, I'll uh, I'll send. Let me see if I can condense this file and send it to you. But most of the stuff I was sharing that had Burmalana in it, and specialty stitches, uh, it was all done with like I think between 1.1 millimeter pitch and like 1.2 at, at its least dense. Um, spot so so that was a, just a ton of fun basically creating all of that specifically just because um i got honestly i had fun relearning it again you know in order to present it right uh it was just it was um and then of course um if the the larger threads i don't know uh, do you guys talk about hook timing at all on the show forgive me if you have We've, we we may have touched on it when someone has a yeah. a, a question here and there, but yeah. Generally, I mean, we talk about hook gap and okay. degree. Mm -hmm. Okay, perfect. So if you cruise over to slide, let's go with sixteen. Um, as this is the uh, the famous uh, what embroidery sewing animation. That's I don't even know how old it is. It's been around <laughs> forever. I take no credit, but I love it. Um, and so, yeah, that's, I mean, this is more of a sewing machine, but the, the concept is still true. 
for an embroidery machine where our you know the hooks that we deal with have a little bit more of a, a thin almost like a needle hook that goes to grab it right and so uh i i throw that disclaimer out there like you got to know what you're doing before you do this but if you're going to run anything larger than text 40 you really need to retime your machine so that it it will um uh, give that that loop uh, just that little bit extra time to form with such thick thread before it goes to grab it you know and pull it down so um but that's that that's the condensed version um of the presentation the last the last slide that's relevant i have to say is probably slide number 18. yeah i was gonna say what's what's the uh the alternative to the yeah the timing difference right so you'll see the uh this is a schmetz fhs needle and they do come in you know sharps ballpoints um they do come in in all shapes and sizes but um, they're showing you like Bermolana, even Bermolana like listed on the color card, even says on the color card to use a 116, um, you know, needle. And this is actually a 12019. So this is this the, the illustration on the left. Uh, the light blue that you see there is like the shaped silhouette of such a large needle, 12019. And they're comparing it to the size of a mere 7010 needle that's in the white right there. And of course, they're drawing a, a line down the, the middle because we're looking at the profile of this particular needle. And uh, so that's your, your traditional needle. And then on the right, they're showing you how they took off the back part of the scarf on that 100, you know, 2019 needle. And that's, that's basically how the FHS needle system has been designed and it's relevant because um i've tried these needles so much that i actually use them in just about everything now and that little scarf coming off the back allows the the loop to form without necessarily having to time the machine so if you're nervous about that kind of timing or setting that timing um you know they they are uh that's something that you can do so yeah that's a that's a comment that ramon is making here and i and, and yeah. I think people will be more comfortable just changing out a needle and and relying on the needle to do the work than than actually start changing their timing, especially especially if you're not going to plan on on running this type of thread on a regular basis, and it's just for a, you know, a job or two or something like that. Right. Um, but yeah, I, you know, going into these different tech sizes and threads is is not only are you are you reducing your your stitch count. Um, you're going to have a softer feel to it, a uh, totally different look using these bigger threads. Um, Absolutely. So it's, it's not just that run of the run of the mill, you know, like I've been doing this almost 30 years and walking back there and, and knowing what goes on, what type of garment and, and how you run hats and everything is kind of second nature to me. And, you know, just listening to your class and, and seeing the different things that, over the years, have I've always seen these kind of retail brands, and 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 I've always kind of thought to myself, "Oh, it's 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 just the thread." And then you know, hearing your class is like it's 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 much more more in depth than it's just a different type of thread. You know, you start getting into different needles. You start talking right. about you know specialty needles like this, or even changing your timing. Um, there's so much involved, but. It can totally change the the look right and and i think the biggest lesson here that at least my takeaway from all this is to encourage people out there it, it is doable not nothing that i'm presenting here is some you know magical unicorn that you have to be a specific membership to get into the <laughs> club it's it's really nothing like that it's just a little bit of knowledge some understanding some mechanical understanding of what needs to happen but for the most part could you take text 27 and possibly only like text 40 and put it in the existing machine with the 7511 or 8012 needle and just get after it with a little bit of digitizing adjustments yes i mean if somebody held a gun to my head and was like you can only pick one i'd be like all right text 40 then because i can just about do any kind of a look with text 40. i don't need you know a tremendous amount of uh detail uh you know if i can only pick one other thread besides you know, 40 weight embroidery thread, what would it be? I've got text 40 sewing. Cause I can, you know, three passes of 40 is a, it's a chunk 
that is a chunk of stitches right there. You know, it sounds like a single bean, but when you throw it out over the course of six or seven millimeters and you got three three strands of that, that's that's pretty good. Mm -hmm. you know? um, and I'm sure you guys have probably tried to like two needles or excuse me, two threads through one needle of like two different colors. Right. Um, there was a thread that um, I think it was, it was called Twisted. And I forget who it was. It was a Coates. Might have been a Mon. I don't know. Because I worked with the same rep who used to be at Coast Nice with the Mon. But they made that just for us at Abercrombie, where they basically took two tonal colors and they twisted them together so that we didn't have to put two threads through one needle. <laughs> we, would, we would just throw it in and go. The downside is you only had these colors to choose from. And even though we had the sample cones, we had to make sure that whatever factory was going to run it had access to those same cones, you know, which was the, the downside. But domestically, if that program was still in the, you know, existence, oh, I'd be buying those spools all, you know, left and right. Cause it just, I mean, could you imagine adding melange to your existing embroidery without having to do anything different? Right. You know, yeah. that's amazing. You know, so, um, it sounds like a couple other manufacturers, Sulky and Robinson Anton, people are saying that they have uh, they have twisted available as well. Yeah, that's that's amazing. Yeah, I love that stuff. It's great. So um, let's see here. Yeah, so the, so the backing I think was another big deal with a lot of the what I was teaching, and that's uh, for the most part, most of the backing I use on almost all my samples um, was uh, wash away. Um, I'm actually going to share with you. I have a pretty, um, pretty deep. Let me share this real quick. Collection of applique uh, photos. Anyone with a link? Link done. Yeah, I can put it into the chat for you, gentlemen. Sorry about the wait. No problem. Um, so just because for whatever reason I can't share, but. Um, it's like the one time I do this and I don't log into my own stream. You know, that's probably what it was. So, <laughs> um, but uh, th th hopefully you guys have access to this and you can kind of show some of the pieces in here. But these are, this is a lot of applique, random applique pictures that I've gathered over the years. Most of it I've done. Some of it I haven't. Some of it I just walked past a kiosk and I was like, this is amazing. Uh, so. See. Any particular one you're looking for? Not necessarily. Just anything that looks like it's Bermolano or something heavy, heavy knit or heavy uh, textured. All right. Let me see. You might recognize some of them from the show. Separate my windows out here. Yeah. Or, uh... And then I saw too that Ramona said something about FHS being hard to find. Honestly, I think that there's a gap between when they introduced them and I think people use them for a while and I feel like I'm the only one who buys them anymore just out of sheer, you know, people don't know about it. I don't, I don't think it was ever meant to, meant for it to not be there anymore, but, but. Oh, I mean, if you have a source you want to share, by all means. Um, my source, I mean, I have, um, I'm, I'm here in Phoenix, Arizona and. Uh, my guy, uh, Tom Bays and his crew over at uh, Advanced Screen Technologies, um, I haven't had any problems getting that from him. So. This was cool. My wife and I were on a cruise, and I just thought this was so cool because they put this fluffy material on this. Uh, they put a satin stitch around it. I don't know how they saw how to tack this thing down. This is, you know, beyond my skill set for sure. <laughs> and, but then at the same time, they had that, uh, like, 3D, um, like, molded, Right there was this cruiser one that was all like that uh, I don't know, PVC material or something. It was really, really cool. Right. That was going to be on my skill set. I was like, wow, that's, I don't know how you'd see that stitch to hold it down. So um, these are just random things. This looks like twill, twill over twill. Um, they, they hadn't washed this yet. A few repair stitches here and there. But this is an example of, you know, looks cool. I don't know what it means. I, I don't remember exactly which project this was for. But it does have, you know, some fun. Uh, yeah, 
So not only was was Joe's uh, Joe's segment in the in the class with Eric and I are, was mainly you know the different types of threads and stuff, but his other class that I sat in on uh, was showing a lot of the applique work that he did or that he does. Right. And, um, just a lot of I think when it comes to applique, you just have a lot more room for creativity. Yeah. Uh, whether you're looking for that that really you know clean cut. Uh, sports type lettering and stuff or you know stuff like that that one i just pulled up that's a little bit more messy and yeah so there should be some more of that tuskegee in there this is cool this is just a screen printed patch we laser cut it and tacked it on simple but i like to show off some of the simpler things because a lot of people have the ability to do this in their own shops uh, small shops big shops but um there was some Tuskegee in there, which is really cool. That was that red piece that I that was showing. That was kind of it's all the way to the bottom, Justin. Or no, there's I guess there's one up there. Yeah, there's a couple, but there's I actually have a shot of it with it, the embroidery side of it still in the hoop, with uh, text forty, which is really cool. This is actually oh. one of the ones that was at the show. Yeah. So, uh, that Brumalana thread in, inside the arrow was melanged already like that. It was marbled and really cool and fun. Um, I think the red was too, but it's hard to see that on the black background. But okay. yeah, we we were doing at the time, I was working for a company called San Segal Sportswear and Landers was a big customer of theirs. So we did a lot of their restaurants. That's more applique. Yeah. <clears throat> Yeah, there's that's a whole whip stitch file right there. If you guys want to see tons and tons of you know floral whip stitch, a lot of connection points, you know, to try to keep from having the trim. Uh huh. But that that thing zoomed in is pretty detailed. It's really nice piece. So what what thread was used on this? So that would be at base based on its scale. I'd have to say that was most likely uh text uh probably a text 40 based off the file name it's a text mm -hmm. 40. yeah oh. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah and i'm thinking that was probably right around text 40 and just um yeah that that one was at the show as well that was Bermalana. I, that's less than i think it was like 8200 stitches or something like that Right, and that's that was uh, just to give you scale. That was something that was like a a center chest. Yeah, it was. It fit inside of those Tajima medallion hoops, where like, those are like just under eight inches, I think. So this is probably like seven and a half by seven and a half or something like that. But uh, yeah. low stitch count, super soft, and it was done on a piece of like four and a half ounce jersey. Um, and it was flat. It didn't have, you know, any any ripples or buckles or curls to it. It just it it came out great. Um, also helps to heat press them, right? Right. Uh, yeah. yeah, those those samples, just the just the feel of those samples. When I was at the at the the show, it was it was amazing to see something that yeah. big on t shirts. Yeah, right. Yeah. I did show some processes here on like yeah, this that's a great piece right there because it shows direct embroidery over screen print with applique and a fill chain all on the same garment as a split you know nice zipper deal so that that that's a good portfolio piece just because of how many things we had to avoid you know right. to make that happen and we weren't shy about the, the pressure of the ink it's like pound it on there let it let it be you know i know that that, that today's market tends to yield a bit more on the don't hammer the ink, you know, but this one we're like, let's get some texture out of this. Nice. A little bit later on in the, in the, the, the reel there, I do have, there it is right there. That one shows it after the wash. So you can see all those little nicks and small little laser abrasions that you don't get to see in the previous photo. Uh -huh. you, you you finally get credit for them after the wash. So yeah, that's that's definitely a bonus when you're working with this type of look. That uh, 
it's it's going to get better with age, you know, kind of like wine. Right. Uh, it's it's just going to add to that look that you're trying to achieve from the get go. Yep, exactly. So that that's a really really fun piece for sure. Um, oh man, Abercrombie! Every time we did something like that, it was always Abercrombie and Fitch is seventeen letters, and they never wanted to only do a single layer, so we had to do thirty four letter laydowns. Oh wow! This is a fun project. This is actually done through um, a company I used to work for called Fabtex. We were asked to do this uh, for a company called uh, Sportique Apparel. They were doing a bunch of uh, band license programs. And we were challenged with trying to figure out a way to do uh, basically like keep it down to like two layer jersey applique only, real simple stuff that would feel good on a t-shirt. So we did um, we did jersey and, and the trick you got to do with jersey is as soon as you laser cut it, it becomes it starts the edges start curling up on you, you know, because it's, it's jersey. And then when you have a raw um, jersey fabric, so what we would do is we would take that that jersey fabric and you know it doesn't take much but you would starch it basically and you press it you know it adhere it to itself laser cut it lay it down and, and sew it down but none of that works properly without the wash you got to have the wash and of course of course the thing that really makes this piece pop so nicely is the flocking of the roses you know on the uh, the crown of roses on the screen print side of it so it was screen printed first and then we would lay down the applique and of course, this is a great piece as well to kind of show people that if you are doing screen print and embroidery, and in this case, applique in your shop, doing multimedia designs where the applique or the embroidery does not need to register perfectly with the screen print is always how you want to design if you're trying to do multimedia. It really allows the yield um, of uh, you know human error to really not, like the, the eye just doesn't notice it. But if you're trying to put a shape inside of another shape, you're just asking for, for trouble. So that's this is a really cool piece. Yeah, I, I know when I when I have time to do the creative stuff and, and come up with the designs that are a little bit different, I I tend to go towards the the messy look, the distressed yeah. or aged look, just because you could hide a lot more mistakes. Honestly, uh, sure. uh, you don't have to be so precise. And what you're doing um and i just I generally just like that look as well yeah. yeah and this is simple too one one hit a screen print right in the left chest and then go over the top of it with a single layer of uh, acrylic felt and just bean stitch probably five pass bean mm -hmm. looks like only a three millimeter throw length a few repair stitches here and there and then some i think that we did uh, the lower left i think it's one of the little icons that we did there i think that was a piece of black like heavy canvas like it was really heavy and we we did uh, i apologize i don't have an up close shot of this or if i do it's buried somewhere but uh we did a real random zigzag to where it just didn't it didn't seal up the edges very well so after the wash as you could imagine it just part of the part of the outside kind of exploded and it was frayed you know, like crazy and other parts of it stay nice and clean. So it was a really cool effect. Um, and then of course the, uh, the text there is just been purple is just, you know, three pass whip out of probably text 27 or something equivalent, but that was a fun piece. So needless to say, do you do just regular designs, Joe? <laughs> uh, yeah. I mean, you know, whatever, whatever, uh, whatever we got to do for sure. But uh, um, yeah, this this was actually kind of cool. Um, I'd have to let uh, Jeremy uh, talk a little bit more intelligently about the hat because that's such a cool. What does that look? Like, buff embroidery up there, or something. It, was, it looks really cool. But um, the same uh, outsourcing company that he went through that I used to work for, Fabtex, they did the uh, the reverse applique. I think on this left chest over here and it, the, the same thing that's in the, uh, a little bit more of a, um, a compl well, similar to this, but a, a more of a complicated version of this was in that Bruce Lee folder that you were in just a bit ago, Justin, because that folder actually has uh, same concept, but 
I feel like the concept is a little bit more up close in some of these sh these shots, where we took the scratch marks from the uh, you know Enter the Dragon movie, and we actually like you know drew them, vectorized them so that it looked as close to the way his his uh, scratch marks were on his body, you know, for that movie. And then there's just a big, huge piece of red um, jersey that sits behind the uh, the garment, right, when you hoop it, and then it goes into the laser bridge machine. Uh, the, there's there's a, a tack that goes around the, uh, the red there at, you know, two and a half millimeters or so, and then the laser bridge comes in and just zaps out the inside of it. And there's a little bit more to it than that because you have to have, like, a sacrificial laser film um, it does have to get washed when you're all done with it. So the edges curl and the laser film is completely washed out. Um, but you have to have something in there to keep the laser from actually cutting through the red part um, to, to make that work. But that's essentially how that was built um, for the uh, Bruce Lee um, family. So a lot of fun that piece was to me. I still have, I think, one left. I don't know where it is. I hope it fits. Jeff, Jeff and his son made a, a reverse applique hat that was really, really cool nice yeah yeah it was really cool uh let me see i don't know if you've noticed if there's any questions jeff probably <laughs> <laughs> it's almost like we need to do a part two that's just questions from part one yeah, yeah. I think exactly forgive me here uh marissa's asking if like um do you split the image to fit on both sides of a zipper jacket so um, cause I just think that that's a really relevant question for any kind of a zipper jacket, any project, this goes back to that one that the green dragon that we were talking about. And I'd have to say that the rule of thumb here, when you're doing something like this is what can you do? And, and you, you have to keep the ink out of the zipper. If you ever want the zipper to ever work again. Mm -hmm. So that that's rule number one. Uh, rule number two is, do you have a stretch machine or do you have a machine wide enough to facilitate something that big and still hoop through the zipper with it being zipped up? And that was not a small zipper. That was a hefty zipper. Right. At the time, we had a, a, a old school like Barrett and turret machine with those monster hoops that you can, you know, get away with murder hooping, you know, a blanket if you like just something really heavy and thick so we got lucky but but if we didn't have that we were using a standard you know tajima single head style machine that are just a you know standard type of machine you would have to do one half and then the other half yes and then of course lining that up is like a whole nother thing but it's not too terrible just with well, the way i split designs when i digitize is I punch the whole design and then I leave a reference point and that reference point, you know, stays there. And then I basically make a copy of that design, delete one half of one side and delete the other half of the other side, take one half, put on its other, you know, that way your, your needle's always returning back to the same center point. Right. So you're, when you take the left side out and you load your right, you know, you know, to go ahead and load the right file as opposed to left. Wow. In designs like that that have that have a big gap and that are kind of a floating type yeah. of design is a lot easier than like baseball jerseys that have the name that you have to line up perfectly. Those are the yeah. ones that are, that are really difficult. Yeah. Oh yeah. The the uh, the the, um, the script. Yes. The script. Mm -hmm. the, those are the ones where you're like, you know, you're trying to measure how much overlap, you exactly. know, that you want, and it 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 starts to bend your brain unless you're doing it every day. It really starts to bend your brain on how you should do it. So a design like that obviously is going to be, you know, gangbusters for having you know just three letters on one side, three on the other. Um, keeps it nice and easy. Um, so 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 to kind of to kind of like summarize at least the classes I taught, it's really just to challenge your suppliers. Um, I think I think. Uh, the majority of people are limited to what their suppliers are selling them. It's not necessarily a bad thing, but if, right, the whole, like, if you'll always do what you've always done, then you'll always have what you've always got. And um, with stepping out into um, get a little bit out of the, the norm, 
you know, you're not going to hurt your machine if you go and you buy Text 27 and start it, putting that in your machine right now. It's not going to hurt a thing. You don't need to buy any special needles. Just put it in, pop it in, and go. But if you really want to start doing, you know, loftier stitches and start to experiment with digitizing um, uh, techniques with these threads, uh, then you got to, you know, start researching all this these Vinci's looks. Um, I can, and I can also say that the best piece of inspiration that I can also leave you with is that, you know, at Abercrombie and Fitch, all we were trying to do was emulate the look of old varsity sweaters, jackets, anything that could take on this old vintage look and a letter that may have fallen off or a t-shirt that's 50 years old where the, the ink has washed out, this old plastisol ink has just crackled and 80% of the center of the letter has fallen off. We're trying to just emulate what that would be like in a mass production environment and reproduce that you know, for the masses. Um, the thread's no different, but since we are doing mass production, we don't have our grandma nearby where we can just, you know, she can just hand sew a letter back on. Right. So how do you reproduce that in a machine environment? And that's why we, you know, that's why this knowledge exists. It's not for any other reason than us trying to achieve these looks with, diff with a different set of tools. But remember, the embroider machine in which we put those tools in is no different than the one you have now. The only disclaimer that I have, and I, I said this in my class as well, yeah. Tell your digitizer, don't drive us crazy. If you are changing up the thread, you got to make sure you tell us um, so we can make the adjustment in the file. Yeah. Uh, otherwise, you know, my my regular digitizing for 48 thread is not going to work if you start getting into these Correct. thicker threads. So. Yeah, that's a really good point. And I've been trying to, especially this last weekend, this after, especially after Eric's podcast on Friday, I really thought about Justin like, on my Applicate website that I have, where I'm, that website is really basically dedicated to my classes. Um, I think I even have recently. I posted my uh, my segment on the Technique Toolkit. I posted that on it because I'm I you know got it on my YouTube as like a streaming you know uh, upload, and so you can if you've got absolutely nothing to do, <laughs> you can check that out. Uh, but I, because I recorded myself while I was there, you know. And I put, but I put up all the slides, you know, up on the, so you can still kind of see, you know, hear me, but you can see the slides as I'm talking. And I want, I was thinking about going back to your, to what you just said about a disclaimer. If you are outsourcing or digitizing, you know, you do have to communicate with them on what you're doing. So what I was thinking of doing is just have a little section for people who are wanting to digitize this with some, some specs, like, you know, these are the, these are the guidelines your digitizer should follow if they're right. going to be using you know, the following threads, and there's going to be right. different guidelines for different threads, needles, etc. And I think that would help kind of kick the count down the road. And I'm going to ask if you are brave enough to do this, please share, please tag us. Because um, I would really, really love to see the work that's being done out there. It's just it's it's that's the best gratifying experience for me is to see it being done. Tell you what, Joe, we're at that hour. This has been awesome. I think we're just, you know, touching the surface here. Um, I'm going to ask everybody, uh, you know, we, we go every other week. I would love to have you back. And in the meantime, anybody have questions, post in the group, send it to Jeff or I, um, kind of come back, revisit it, get a little bit more information, answer any questions that come up. Um, so if you're down to come back, Joe, we would love to have you again. Absolutely. I would love it. Awesome. So, uh, Plug your stuff really quick, where they can find you, your YouTube, your your website. Yeah, so uh, all, a lot of my, uh, so applicatejoe.com if you want the technical stuff. And if you want to see a lot more pieces and portfolio kind of stuff, uh, my my daily driver, uh, ambercreative.com uh, is just amber with a three dot com. Uh, that is just a group of awesome creative guys who we just live and breathe this stuff all the time. So. Uh, our YouTube, um, just look us up, Amber Creative on YouTube, and you're going to see all the silly stuff that we're doing. Follow us. We're on pretty much all the major social medias. And if you just, if you've got an idea bouncing around that you just cannot get out, you need some answers, hit me up on applicatejoe.com 
or hit me up on LinkedIn and we'll, we'll I'll figure out a way to, uh, to get with you. Those, uh, Jeff just put those, those links in the, in the comments. So ch definitely check those out. Give Joe a, a visit and check out his stuff. Uh, like I said, just being there for the couple days at the show, listen to his stuff. It was, it was mind blowing stuff and stuff that, you know, gets my creative juices going, wanted me to try some different stuff. And eventually sometime soon, you're going to be seeing some, some new stuff, hopefully coming out of, of my brain. So you uh, may have to send out some, uh, some like, uh, you know, little kits, right. So people can get started. I think that's probably the best way to push us yeah. over the nets, Right. Exactly. Exactly. Starting kits. Uh, is there any other news that we want to talk about, Jeff? Anything coming up? Not that I can think of, but I don't have a great memory. So, <laughs> not um, a lot. if if you aren't in our uh, in Bird in your group on Facebook, definitely join. Um, you know, we're we're doing a lot more stuff in the in the software software realm of things. Uh, if you want to check out the Floriana software, if you are a member in the group, we have some special pricing for you, some discounts. So check that out. Uh, again, thank you for coming today, Joe, and, and sharing. And My pleasure. Uh, Thanks for having me. Yeah, we'll definitely have a part two. We'll definitely announce that when, when Joe's available. Um, and check Joe out, and hopefully uh, we're going to see a lot more of him. Awesome. All right. Well, guys, I'm Jeff Fuller from Fuller and Burger Works. That's Justin Armenta from JA Digitizing Studio, and we have Joe Kramer from Amber Creative. I'd like to thank you guys for hanging out with us, and we'll catch you next time. Good night, everybody. <laughs>